This lesson marks a significant departure from all of our previous lessons on organic reactivity because here we're going to focus in on radicals, which are species containing an unpaired electron and thus an odd number of electrons overall. The reason we're focusing on radicals now is that it's relatively easy to generate a carbon-centered radical from an alkene, and so radicals are relevant to the chemistry of alkenes. In this lesson, we're going to look at the structures of radicals in general and the stability trends that flow from those structures. We're going to develop some new conventions for showing how electrons move in radical reactions, some of which we've actually already seen in previous discussions of mass spectrometry. And then we're going to look at examples of radical reactions, including a radical promoted hydrohalogenation reaction with anti-Markovnikov selectivity. Because radicals are so unstable, this necessitates the development of a completely new mechanistic paradigm for understanding how radical reactions work that actually has some analogy to nuclear chain reactions that you may be familiar with, for example, in earlier studies of nuclear fission. We'll use that as an analogy for understanding how radical chain mechanisms work, which are fundamentally different from the linear mechanisms we've seen to date, and even catalytic mechanisms. Let's begin with a look at the structures of free radicals in general, especially carbon-centered radicals, and talk about how we represent electron flow in radical reactions. Free radicals contain an unpaired electron. This means that they have an odd number of electrons overall. In order to not have too many electrons, this typically means that the radical center has seven electrons total, as we see in this example on the left-hand side of the slide. Because seven is less than eight, and the radical carbon would like to have eight electrons to satisfy the octet rule, free radicals are electron deficient, or electron poor in general. Their structures and stability trends reflect this, and the closest analogous structure is one in which the radical electron is simply missing. This would be a carbocation. Let's briefly review the structural properties of trigonal carbocations. So what I'm going to do is turn this carbocation structure on its side so that one of the R groups is pointed out towards us, and the other is pointed back away from us. Carbocations with three R groups have this trigonal structure, meaning they're sp2 hybridized, and the empty orbital that sort of corresponds to the positive charge is an atomic 2p orbital. This is really the site of electrophilicity, or electron-accepting behavior of a carbocation. Nucleophiles approach above or below the plane of the carbocation to overlap efficiently with one or the other of the lobes of this p orbital. Carbon radicals with three R groups have an analogous structure. And just to emphasize this point, here is a calculated structure for the tert butyl radical in which the radical carbon is connected to three methyl groups. This orbital that's shown in the center is the half-filled orbital of the radical. And so this green dot I'm drawing here signifies the radical electron here. In the radical, this orbital is half-filled, meaning it contains one electron. But this is still an electron deficient species because of the seven electrons associated with the radical carbon. Notice that the geometry at the radical center is still trigonal planar, just like the carbocation case, and the hybridization implied by the fact that the radical electron is in a pure p orbital, which we can see just by the shape here, must be sp2. This is suggested by the geometry as well. Why is it that the radical electron prefers to be in a 2p orbital relative to something like a hybrid. Why is it more stable in a 2p orbital rather than something like an sp3 hybrid? To understand this, let's consider the relative energies of the 2p and sp3 hybrids. The additional s character in the sp3 hybrid means that it's lower in energy than the 2p orbital. And while this seems to stabilize electrons, in an electrophilic case where the 2p orbital or the hybrid is empty, or in this particular case, half-filled, the orbital is more stable, another way to put it is, the unpaired electron is more stable at higher energy, because nucleophiles or electron donors are less likely to engage with a higher energy unfilled or half-filled orbital than a lower energy unfilled or half-filled orbital. This is consistent with stability trends of orbitals that we've seen previously. Filled orbitals are more stable at lower energies, unfilled orbitals are more stable at higher energies, and because radicals are electron deficient, or electrophilic, their stability trends reflect electron deficient species like carbocations, and more generally, empty molecular orbitals. In carbon radicals that don't contain three R groups linked to the carbon center, the radical electron doesn't really have the option of occupying a p orbital, as we'll see. So in these cases, 
the radical electron must be in an sp or sp2 hybrid. Consider, for example, the alkyne radical. In this structure, the radical electron must be located in a hybrid, specifically an sp hybrid. Since the p orbitals associated with this carbon are engaged in pi bonds with the other carbon of the triple bond, and the remaining p orbital, for example, that could be located where I'm drawing this large lobe of the hybrid, goes into an sp hybrid orbital associated with bonding to the other carbon of the alkyne as well. In this case, then, the orbital housing the radical electron is sp hybridized. In a vinyl or alkenal radical, we have a similar situation where the radical electron can't possibly be in a 2p orbital. Since the 2p orbitals are engaged in hybrids to the other carbon of the double bond and this R group, as well as a pi bond with the other carbon of the double bond. This means that the radical electron in this case must be located in an sp2 hybrid orbital now. Just for completeness, let's go ahead and draw the orbital structure of a trigonal radical with three R groups linked to the radical center. Here now, because there are no pi bonds at the radical center and the hybridization of that radical carbon is sp2, there is an empty p orbital available to house the radical electron. The point of identifying these hybridizations is to elucidate a stability trend of radicals based on the hybridization of the orbital that houses the radical electron. And the bottom line here is that radical stability depends on the hybridization of the orbital housing the unpaired electron in the same way that carbocation stability does. The most stable radicals are those in which the unpaired electron is located in a 2p orbital, highest in energy. The least stable radicals are those in which the unpaired electron is located in an sp hybrid. This hybrid orbital has the lowest energy, and so it's most susceptible to attack by electron donating molecules or nucleophiles. Just anecdotally, alkynal radicals are extremely rare. Vinyl and arene radicals, where you see a radical carbon with one double bond and one single bond, are somewhat more common. And trigonal radicals are the most common of all, although, although all three of these intermediates are relatively unstable. Finally, let's talk about how we represent electron flow in radical reactions. Most curved arrows in organic chemistry show the movement of two electrons. But if we leave out part of the head of a curved arrow, by convention, that represents the movement of a single electron. And you'll see these a lot in radical reactions. Often, a lot of these arrows are needed to show completely electron flow in radical reactions. And here we're going to list these, and one point I want to make from the outset is that we can organize these different types of electron flow by thinking about the half-filled H orbital as an important NBO. And we'll use that as we enumerate the flows here. The first type of electron flow you'll see in radical reactions is homolytic bond cleavage. And this is simply the cleavage of a single bond between two atoms with one electron going to each atom involved in the bond. The reverse of this is the coupling of two radicals to form a new single bond, like we see on the right-hand side of the slide. And this is shown by showing both radical electrons heading to the space between the two radicals, signifying the formation of a new bond. Radical additions to pi bonds are also possible. And this is somewhat analogous to the ADN elementary step, but requires a few more arrows, since we need two arrows to show the formation of the new single bond, and an additional third arrow to show the fate of the other electron involved in the pi bond. Notice that the product here contains a new sigma bond, in this case between bromine and carbon, and a new radical has been created. In essence, the radical character has shifted from the bromine radical onto one of the carbons of the alkene. Finally, we can also think about radical addition, quote unquote, to a sigma bond. This isn't really an addition reaction because the sigma bond breaks, but the electron flow is analogous to radical addition to a pi bond in that a new sigma bond is formed and the bond, the sigma bond now between hydrogen and chlorine here, breaks. Three arrows are needed, once again, since we're forming a bond and breaking a bond using single electrons. And notice that here, as in the case of radical addition to a pi bond, the radical character has shifted from a carbon-centered radical onto chlorine. Using the letter H to represent the half-filled orbital containing the radical electron, we can label these latter three electron flows. This looks like H to H with two half-filled orbitals coming together. Here we have pi to H with a pi bond engaging with the half-filled orbital, and here we have sigma to H with a sigma bond engaging with the half-filled orbital. These four types of electron flow account for all the elementary steps that we'll see in radical reactions.
and as in the elementary steps of polar or two-electron organic mechanisms, getting familiar with these steps now will make it easier to understand radical mechanisms moving forward.